message conditioned in hope. And so if you're able to, let me invite you to rise for the reading of the infallible inner word of the living God. Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to be reading from verses 19 to 25, but our focus will be in verse 23. The writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us pray. Our Holy Father and most glorious God, we we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have received your Son. We thank you that we can read about your Son. We thank you that we can stand firm in the gospel of his salvation. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that through his gospel, there is eternal hope. And so help us to see that this day, O God, through your word, that we may grow in Christ, that we may have endurance to live out the Christian life and to encourage each other along. For we pray these things in Christ's holy name and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated. Waiting. How many of us love to wait? (laughs) Don't you love it when you make a phone call and they say, please hold, your call is very important to us, right? The next available operator will be with you in 20 minutes, Mm -hmm. right? Don't you love that? They're like, oh my goodness. I remember one time I waited 45 minutes on a call and I knew I was going to wait that long. So I made sure that I took this call while I was driving an hour to a job. And I hated waiting. And in fact, you wait so long that you forget what you're even there for. Many times, right? You ever go to a doctor and you, you show up on time? You show up, you have a 10 o'clock appointment, you show up at, at, at 9.45, you're there an extra 15 minutes. And 10 o'clock rolls around and you ask the receptionist, when is the doctor going to see me? Well, you'll just have to wait a little bit longer. And you wait another 15 minutes and then the doctor sees you. But if you show up 15 minutes late... They're not going to see you at all, right? We hate to wait. We hate to be waiting on people, right? And we hate for people to wait on us. We see that most vividly in the lives of children, do we not? Children hate to wait. Yesterday I was at my, or I should say Friday, I was at my sister's house, and she has two little kids, right? Somewhere under the age of 10. It's amazing. As you get older, you forget what kid, how old little kids are. You're like, I don't know, he's 5, 7, 10, whatever he is, right? But my father was there as well. And so their grandparents were up from Florida. My father gave him his Christmas gift early, which was cash. And so what does a little kid want to do the minute you give him some cash? He wants to go to the store and spend it, right? So the, from the moment I walked into my sister's house, my nephew is driving my sister and my brother-in-law crazy. Can we go to the store? Can we go to the store? Can we go to the store? And my, keep, my sister keeps saying, later, later. He comes back 15 minutes later. He goes, is it later yet? When can we go to the store? It got, to, it got so aggravating that they sent him off to his room. And as he's crying in his room, you can hear him downstairs. And he said, when are we going to go to the store? Can I come out when we go to the store? I mean, he's just losing his mind. Kids hate to wait. They hate to wait for their food, right? You ever get a hungry kid on your hands? That's rough, right? They start banging on the table. They just just get aggravated. They get what we call hangry, right? They're so hungry, they're angry, right? Try keeping an impatient kid happy. That's a task in and of itself. Try going on a trip with them, right? What is something the kids always say? Are we there yet? Yeah, you know it, right? 
And what do the parents say? One more word and I'm turning this car around. But as they lay in the back seat, they are not only miserable because they hate to wait, but they make everyone else miserable around them. Right? And sometimes we can be like that as well. But maybe not so bad. I, for one, do not like to wait. I start to get aggravated. Jackie knows. She takes me shopping with her. And I'm like, oh, please. Especially when I have to go to the ladies section. I'm like, oh, man. There should be like a lounge chair there where the guys could just sit down and relax, right? But Jackie doesn't like it either. So when I take her to Home Depot, she hates waiting around. She, or I take her to Home Depot or an electronics store. She says, I'm just going to throw myself on the floor and cry because I just want to get out of here. We just don't like to wait. But I've got a more, I would say, civil way of waiting. Here's me shopping with Samantha. She was shoe shopping. So there's me. That's how I like to wait. I found myself a little spot where I could take a nap, right? And that seems to be a consistent theme with me. Here I am at the airport waiting for a flight. There I am in another airport waiting for another flight. So if you see in our camera, you'll always see pictures of me like this. Here's me waiting for a class at seminary. Right? So I figure to myself, if I've got to wait, let me not get aggravated. Let me just take a nap. Right? I don't want to get aggravated. But the reality is, my friends, that's not how Jesus wants us to wait. You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? What were the disciples doing? They were acting like Mike Rojas. They were laying down and they were taking a nap. And in fact, Jesus actually rebukes them. He's like, you couldn't even stay awake one hour watching with me? And we should really think about that. Because Christ wants for us to be awake, alert, as we wait upon him. This is why it's important for us to really celebrate Advent. Because it kind of reorients our minds of how a confessing believer should be waiting, anticipating the return of Christ. And so how does Jesus want us to wait? Well, he wants us to stay alert. And not just alert waiting for him, standing there staring into the sky when he's going to come down, but to remain alert and active. You see, Jesus wants us to be active in our lives because if not, our mind begins to wander. Right? We start thinking about other things. You ever been there? You're waiting and your mind just starts to wander. But that's not what Christ wants for us. He wants us to wait upon him in a very specific manner. This is why Jesus says this in Luke chapter 21, verse 34. He says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation. In other words, with licension, or you start giving yourself over to the world, right? You, and some people think like that. Some confessing believers, they're very immature in their faith. They think, well, you know, Jesus is not going to return today. I'm going to go out and have a good time, or I'm going to indulge in this, even though I know God is really not with it. But Jesus says, watch yourself, lest you be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. In other words, you start saying, you know what? He's not coming back yet. Let me just indulge in this that I have before me. <clears throat> and he warns us, and that day may come upon you suddenly like a trap. Let me tell you, you do not want to be surprised by the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. This is what I love reading about. This is why I love reading about the Reformers. Whenever you read about the lives of reformers, they were always active. They were always active, and not just from a theological perspective, but from an evangelistic perspective as well. Martin Luther, not only was he make, writing so many things, so many books, so many trees, but he was also um, uh, taking in young students into his house on the Lord's Day in the evening where they would all sit around the table and have a meal and talk about the Word of God and how to be further transformed by the Word of God. He used to call it his table talk. In fact, Ligonier Ministries created their, 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 their entire magazine, their, their articles, under that name, Table Talk. Why? So that we would have something, sort of like a Reader's Digest for Christians, that we would have something that we could converse with one another about in order to encourage each other along to remain active until the Lord returns. Yes, Jesus wants us to remain active in our faith. 
Last week I was speaking about our spiritual health. And part of that spiritual health is remaining active. And he wants us to remain active in the hope of his return. I love what John Calvin used to say as he was dying and as, as, as he was rewriting his institutes of the Christian faith. His, his caretaker would tell him, uh, you know, Master Calvin, just lay the books down for a little bit and just rest. And he would say, shall my Lord find me laying idle? Right? He thought to himself, no, I must be about the work of my Lord. And it wasn't just for him. It was for you and I as well. We should always be abounding in the work of the Lord in some way or another. Whether it's reading the word, whether it's meditating upon the word. And yes, you can meditate upon the word even as you work. Many times I'm out there and I'm doing my job. And as I'm doing my job, I'm thinking about the word of God. I'm thinking about a Bible study. I'm thinking about a sermon series. I'm thinking about other, t- other series that I'm dying to, um, to, to teach and to, and to preach. And so we can do that. And that's how Christ wants us to be. He wants us to be actively waiting upon him. And let me tell you what happens if we're not active. Let me tell you what happens if we kind of pull back from the word of God, from the ministry of Christ that he's called us to. What happens to us? We become wimpy Christians, right? We become weak. We become frail in our faith. We think we're strong like the fellow on the screen, but we're not very strong at all. And Christ calls us to be strong. And listen, let me, let me be honest. In our life in Christ, we are going to, we're going to encounter struggles. The enemy is set against derailing you from being a Christian. The enemy would love nothing more than, to Christ, than for Christ to come back and find a weak church. The enemy, Satan, and all of his minions are working 24-7. One theologian said, the devil is the only minister that never takes a day off. Because he's ministering evil. And he's seeking to sow it in your life and in mine. Idle hands are what? The devil's playground, right? And so Christ calls us to be active so that we will be strong when the day of of adversity comes upon us. And let me tell you, that day will come if it hasn't come already. And if it's come already, it's coming again. That's just how it is. But Christ calls us to persevere until he returns. And the way we're able to persevere is through his word. And we should look at persevering as something that we can rejoice in. We should look at the struggle as something we can rejoice in. We should look at the hope that is ours in Christ as something that we can rejoice in. This is why the Apostle Paul would write in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, these words. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Yes, the more you suffer, the more you will endure. Think about your own life. Think about all the struggles that you have gone through and how the word of God, the spirit of God has gotten you through them. That has made you stronger today. And so as you will endure those sufferings later on in your life, they will make you stronger and stronger. And it is that, it's that, it's that strong Christian that Christ is looking for when he returns. And he, Paul goes on to say, and endurance produces Character. Yes, Christian character. Remember when you were first saved, if you can remember that far back? Remember how you were weak and how you were naive in the faith? And how much stronger you are today? Well, just think how much stronger you'll be in the tomorrows to come. Because it produces character. And character produces hope. The hope is always there, but we begin to grow in it. Hope, And this is not a hope just in hopingness, if that's even a word. This is a hope that is rooted and grounded in the founder and the perfecter of our hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what he says, and hope does not put us to shame. No, hoping in Christ will never put you to shame. Hoping in the world will put you to shame. Hoping in the stock market, that will definitely put you to shame. Hoping in the government, we know what that's going to put upon you, right? Hoping in your own finances, that will put you to shame. I can't tell you how many times I've been disappointed at my finances. Why have you done this to me? (laughs) You know? 
but it's us. Anything that we produce has the, has the propensity to put us to shame, but not Christ. Christ will never put us to shame. The world may look at you like a fool, but if you are rooted and grounded in the person and work of Christ, you will never be put to shame. Amen. But Paul goes on, and he goes on to tell us why we will never be put to shame. And he's here, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we can endure. We can wait on Christ. Why? Because we have the hope of Christ given to us by the love of God in the Holy Spirit implanted within us. So we don't have to wait sleeping. We don't have to wait crying and kicking and complaining. No, we wait in peace because we have an eternal hope. That's what the verses before us are talking about. That's what the verses before us are pointing to. You see, the writer of Hebrews is telling us, you have been saved by Christ. That's the earlier verses. And he's going through how Christ has saved us. And he's saying, this is why you can endure in hope. And your call in hope is to, is to not only build yourself up in hope, but to build others up around you in hope. Turn on the TV today, my friends. Listen to a news broadcast. There's not a lot of hope there. The news thrives when there's bad news. The news doesn't thrive when there's good news. People stay glued to the TV when there's bad news. And that's, it seems that that's all we get these days. But there's only good news coming from Christ. And the good news is this, that your eternal salvation and mine is sealed in the person and work of Christ. And he wants for us to live like we understand that, to live like we believe that, to live like we own that and we want to pass it down to our children, to the next generation. Anything less will not do. Christ is calling us to be bold ambassadors for him. And how can you tell someone to have hope in Christ in this world of hopelessness if you don't have it yourself? And so through these verses, the Lord our God is leading us to have a deeper understanding of the hope that is ours in Christ. Like I said, our focus is going to be verse 23, and I've broken it down into three parts, 23a, 23b, and 23c. But they all fit in within the context of the verses before us. And so here in verse 23a, we see that it is a call to all believers to never let go of the hope of our confession of faith. Yes, you and I have made a confession of faith and we have a possession of faith. Faith in the eternal Son of God. And we're called to live in that hope. In other words, we're called to live like we truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like we truly believe that he has paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. To live like we truly believe that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. To live like we believe that we are called to repent each and every day of our sins and to, and to live a life that bears fruit of that repentance. So that the unbelieving world will see that and glorify God. That they'll see that we're just not trying to share the gospel with them. We're trying to live the gospel in their presence. And so here in the first part of verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us hold fast. Notice the us. I want you to please note the us refers to confessing believers. This is not a universal call to the rest of the world. Right? When the going gets tough, you will see who the Christians really are. When the, heat bo- when the heat begins to be turned up, you'll see who the true believers are. Remember back after 9-11, all the churches were packed. And now they've all dwindled down. Why? Because the threat is gone. So you know what? I no longer need God. And people are like, God, I'll let you know when I need you again. 
Another tragedy will come upon the earth, and it will, and all the people will be flooding back into the churches again. And it's not to call them hypocrites, but you know when that happens, it's up to us as confessing believers to then strongly live out our faith, to show the unbelievers who come to church just to save their own skin, right? That they can be truly saved, not in the moment, but eternally, if they turn their eyes and their hearts to Christ. It's going to happen again. If history has taught us anything, it's taught us that man is evil and man injures man. And we will have tragedies brought upon us by man. And we as confessing believers must stand and be ready to meet those tragedies and to share the gospel of Christ with all those who will be afraid. And so he's saying, let us, the confessing believers, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. The idea here is this. is the idea of holding fast, right? The rudder of the ship. The steering wheel of the ship. When you listen to the, to the writings of the, of, of, the, of the apostles and the writers of, of Scripture, they're always speaking in terms of how people were living out their lives. The most dangerous place to ever be was on the sea. Why? Because the sea was filled with with turmoil. The ocean could come and take your boat any way you wanted, but a strong captain would hold fast the rudder of the ship, and he knew how to maneuver the ship through the storms. And this is what the writer of Hebrews tells us. Hold fast to your confession of hope. Do not let it go. Do not allow yourself to be lost In the struggle, never let go. And that's who we are in Christ. We never let go. We never let go of our faith. We never lay it aside. We never say that, well, you know what? This issue is too big for the Bible to handle. No, we never let it go. We hold fast to our hope. And why do we do that? Because as we hold fast, we develop endurance, just like Paul was saying. We develop endurance to live out the Christian life. Anybody can be a confessing believer when times are easy. But it's the true confessing believer that stands firm when the times are tough. And during the easy times, if we learn to hold fast, if we learn how to properly navigate through our lives, then we will develop the endurance to deal with the difficult times. And as we do, we will grow stronger in Christ. This is what Christ wants. He wants us to be strong in our faith when he returns to be with us. So the writer of this verse is telling us to hold fast to our confession of hope. What is he referring to? Well, it takes us back to verses 19 to 22. He says, therefore, brothers, and the therefore is referring to the fact that he has just said, you have been saved. Basically, I'm boiling it down. But you have been saved by grace through faith. That God has done for you what you could not have done for yourself. Right? And he's saying, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place um, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near, that is, draw near to God with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, he's saying, understand who you are now. You no longer have to live in shame because your sin has been atoned for. You no longer have to think that you're not worthy of the gospel because Christ has made you worthy. And he's made you worthy to carry out his work. He has made you worthy to bear his name. He has made you worthy to be part of the family of God. You didn't do it yourself. We were unworthy before he found us. But after he found us and gave us his love and gave us his life, we became worthy in him. As he's saying, now you've got boldness in Christ to enter the throne room of God, to come before him. That's the reason why we can pray each and every day. Because we pray to him in Christ's holy name. That's why the veil was torn from top to bottom when Christ died on the cross. 
Because he did it on our behalf. You notice each and every time Jesus prayed to God the Father, he always called him Father or Abba. But when he was on the cross, what did he say? He said, my God, my God. Why? Because at that moment he had been separated from God. And now he was speaking on our behalf. And he said, now I have given you access to the Father. Therefore, live boldly in me. Stand firm in the hope of my salvation. This is what the writer of Hebrews understands. And the very next chapter will be the chapter of faith. And it goes on and on. And as you go deeper and deeper in the book of, of, of Hebrews, you realize this is an explosive letter to the church, helping us understand the true faith, the true hope, the true peace, the true love that we have in Christ. The book of Hebrews is like, it's like the protein in the shake that gives us muscle to live out the life in Christ. He's saying our bodies have been washed with pure water. In other words, there's no stains left. Christ has washed it all away. Jesus paid it all. There's nothing left for us to pay. And so we can go forth boldly throughout our lives, clinging to the hope that is ours in him. But these verses also tell us something else. They tell us that through our faith and our trust in Christ, we can draw near to God. Yes, God is only a prayer away. Not so for the unbeliever. God says in his word, he does not hear their prayers. But he hears yours. He hears mine. Why? Because he hears them through his one and only son. This is why your unbelieving friends will call you up and ask you to pray for them. This is why the people would go to Moses and say, pray for us for we have sinned against God. Because they knew that they could not go before God because of their sin. But you and I don't have that issue. The throne room of grace is open to each and every one of us. Each and every moment of each and every day. And God is calling us to draw near to him. I want to ask you today, how's your hope? How's hope doing in your life? If your hope is weak, draw near to God and your hope will be stronger. If your hope is weak, read the word of God and he will enhance your hope. These verses are written that we can draw near to God and that we can develop spiritual strength. This is what Christ wants from each and every one of us. And he's allotted a measure of faith, a measure of hope to each and every one of us that we can live that potential out. And so we shouldn't be looking at each other saying, well, you know, I don't have as much hope as Terry or I don't have as much hope as, as anyone else. No, God has allotted to each and every one of us a measure of faith, but he calls us to grow in it and to stand firm in the hope, in the equal hope that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he says here, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. Right? We have got to confess our hope in Christ each and every day to ourselves. Right? And it's as simple as saying, you know what? Lord, I trust you. I trust you for my life. When we read the word of God, Lord, I don't understand it, but help me believe it. Help me understand your word more. Father, this sounds beautiful. I don't know how to apply it, but help me to that point. I'm trusting in you. And we can almost say that trust and hope are synonymous, right? Because they are. Because the more you trust God, the greater hope you have in God. And the greater hope you have in God, the more you will trust in God. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to impart upon us. To have a deeper sense of trust and hope in God. To hold fast to hope. <clears throat> People believe that they can do many things in life, but no one does anything in life if they lack hope. Most people that call a suicide hotline call because they have lost all hope. And that's a sad thing. It's a sad thing when a human being feels like there's nothing left to live for. But that's what happens when we don't have hope. And so Christ calls us 
And the apostles speak about it over and over again in many different ways. To be that people, to show the world, this dark world, that we have an eternal hope. That we may be living in turbulent times. There may be a new strand of the coronavirus out there. But we have hope. Hope in Christ. Hope in the second coming of our Lord and Savior. That we're not relying upon the government. We're not relying upon anything. All those things are good and they help us from time to time. But the true help, the help that will never let us down, is the hope in Christ. Think about how many confessing believers must have died because of coronavirus. You think just unbelievers died? No. Confessing believers died as well. And it wasn't the coronavirus that took their life. It was God who had brought them home to be with his son. They died in hope. Look at all the Old Testament saints. They died in hope, waiting for the coming of the Christ. That's why it says that Jesus, Jesus led the captives in, the, in, the, in his train. Because he led them. Because now they had seen the gospel of their salvation. You and I are called to thrive in hope. And I, like I said, not just hope in anything. And we've got to understand what we have hope in. Why? Because when people ask us, and they will, why we have such a hope, we've got to be able to speak to it. We've got to be able to speak to the fact that we have hope because of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I have hope that I can be forgiven because Jesus fulfilled all the things that I couldn't. He fulfilled all the holy days. Right? He filled, fulfilled the Ten Commandments. He fulfilled all the acts of righteousness that God required of me, and I couldn't do it. He fulfilled them on my behalf. He says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Fulfill it for who? Fulfill it for us. That all who would believe in his name would not be put to shame. And he did it. Mission accomplished. But part of that mission was him being an atonement for sin. And he fulfilled that as well. The Bible says there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And Jesus fulfilled that for us as well. That's why we have hope. And the Bible also says that God will not allow his holy one, his anointed one's body to seek corruption. And so on the third day, according to the scriptures, what did God do? He raised him from the grave. And when he raised him from the grave, Jesus says, I go off to be with the Father. Right? And when I do, I will send the Holy Spirit to be with you, the comforter, the paracletes, the helper, to help you in this life. And so as he ascended to heaven, he promised to send his spirit, and he did. And it's dwelling in you and I today. That's why we have hope. It's not just in anything. It's in Christ. But even greater than that, as if there could be something greater than that, but there is. We have a hope in the return of King Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. One day we will see him come again. Some of us may go off to be with him. Maybe all of us will go off to be with him before he returns. We don't know. But we know that when he returns, he will bring us with him. We will all see that glorious day. And if we could, I don't know if we could, but if we could look back on, on, our, on our lives um, while we were here on earth, we would look at how futile the things were that we lived for. When you think about it, right, the American dream or whatever country you come from, the way we think about living, it's futile in comparison to the glories that are ours in Christ. It's futile in terms of the eternal life that we will li be living in Christ. And so Christ calls, he says, you know what, I want you to be here for now. I want you to be my ambassadors, but I want you to be living in hope, awaiting the day that I will return to be with you and take you home to be with me. This is our call in life. And it's this idea that brings us to the second part of verse 23. Second part of verse 23 is a call to be steadfast in our faith. Yes, Christ calls us to be steadfast in our faith. In other words, to be like a rock. He says here, without wavering. The greatest thing a confessing believer could ever do is never waver on the word of God. We could say, you know what? I don't understand it, but I believe it. I disagree with it, but it's true. 
We are never to waver when it comes to the word of God or the will of God. I was reading a, a book, and the author was talking about this understanding of sin. He says, when you speak to most people, most confessing believers, they will say, and I would say as well, what is sin? Well, sin is, is violating the law of God, right? And that's, that's right. He says, but how do we violate the law of God? This is the question that he asks. And the answer that he gives is, is really a profound answer. He says, well, the first commandment that we break is idolatry. Right? Because we create in our minds an image of ourselves that we want to live out that is not in the image of God. Right? And so when we plan out a life that excludes God, that's the height of idolatry. Right there, you've already committed a sin. And so for the confessing believers, we, as we look at our lives, we are to plan our lives according to the will and word of God, to all that Jesus has taught the disciples and the disciples have imparted upon us. Which brings us back to this, without wavering. Don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Just look straight ahead. And I want to remind you of the atmosphere in which these writers were living. When they're thinking about do not waver, it's, it's hard to not think about a Roman soldier. You see, a Roman soldier believed that he was fighting a righteous war. Why? Because they believed that Caesar, the emperor, was God. And they were fighting on behalf of a deity. And so they felt that their fight, whatever it was, was just because their God had sent them to fight. And so they would not waver. They would not retreat. They would only move forward, sword in hand, ready to do battle. And in many ways, that's how confessing believers must live. The sword, the word of God in hand, leaning forward, leaning into our faith, ready to stand firm and do battle if the Lord calls us to. And sometimes the battle isn't as, as vicious as we would think of a battle, of a normal battle. Sometimes it's just a conversation. And it's Satan trying to derail us or derail someone else or lead someone into heresy or falsehood through um, uh, the, the conniving or the twisting of God's word. And we must stand ready to be able to speak the truth into the life of people. And there's other ways that we can sometimes lose our footing. And we've got to think about that. And we've got to think about it individually because it's different for each and every one of us. But the one thing that remains the same is that we are to be immovable. Immovable like a rock. Like a rock that, is, that, that, is, that has been planted by God in the middle of an ocean. It, with, with icebergs and everything else around it. These, these giant icebergs. When you see the tip of an iceberg, guess what? There's a massive one below it. Right? But he calls us to be that rock that stands in the midst of chaos without moving. And that can be difficult because sometimes we feel like this rock, right? Like the waves just crashing upon us. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to a beach that's very rocky and you're trying to get out into the water and as you try to get out, boom, a wave hits you and it knocks you back. And you go a little bit forward and boom, another wave hits you and it knocks you back. And you're kind of trying to, you're trying to time it just in time so you can jump in to the water. But you keep getting knocked around. The scariest place to be when the waves are crashing is near a rock because it will smash you against that rock. And sometimes life seems this way. The apostles know that. The writer of, this, of, the, of, this, of the book of Hebrews understands that. And that's why they're giving us this exhortation. They understand you know, that life is going to be difficult, that the waves are going to crash on us in many different forms, right? Some of these waves will be, you know, let's just say family. Sometimes family hits us like that massive wave that just se seeks to knock us down. And sometimes it might be from a, from a religious perspective or a biblical perspective. Other times it may just be from an emotional perspective. But either way, these verses are calling us to never waver. To think before we speak. To think before we act. Why? Because sometimes family can be that wave. Sometimes our employer can be that wave. I know we speak individually, right? A number of you have issues sometimes at work that you, get, you feel like, like, like the employer or, or the employees just pounding on you day in and day out. 
Sometimes the world, the world events, can make us feel like, like the waves are just crashing on us. We don't know where to turn, especially during a presidential election, especially these last 10, 15 years. It just seems like everything is just so, everything's just, just set up just to divide us more and more as individuals, to divide us more and more as confessing believers. And the waves are just pounding on us left and right. But the same thing happens sometimes with our community, right? Whether it's our small community or the broader community, we see marches, we see, we see protests, and we feel, feel like we have to change our, our message in order to meet these protests and these social movements. No, we don't. We need to remain steadfast, unwavering. We don't need more activists. No, we don't need more Christian activists. We need more evangelists. That's what changes a community. That's what changes a society, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anything else is just temporary. But then there's also our friends. Oh, those well-meaning friends, right? Remember people telling us, you know, I used to like you guys more before you started going to church, right? And that kind of hurt because I really enjoyed hanging out with those people on Sundays. But I realized I owed God a debt of worship each and every Lord's Day. Therefore, I must be there. And while my heart felt like it was tearing because I wanted to be with my family and my friends, right? But at the same time, I wanted to go worship God. I knew that it was my calling in life to go and worship God. And he calls us to be unwavering in that respect. And so I ask you this morning, what waves are crashing upon you? Hmm? It could be any one of these issues. Could be the person sitting right next to you. I'm not pointing to you, Jason, or anything like that in particular. I'm just stating out in the open, right? It could be anything. It could be a worry that's not even up on the screen. But whatever it is, do not allow it to bring you down. Stand firm in your hope. Stand firm in the word of God, never, ever wavering. Which brings us to the latter part of verse 23. Latter part of verse 23 reminds believers to be faithful because our Lord is faithful. Jesus is not asking us to do anything he has not already done. Yes, he has lived that life that we were supposed to live. He has felt the struggles. We read in the scriptures that he has wept. Even though he knew that Lazarus would be raised again um, in just a couple of days. Even though he knew that Lazarus would one day die again and be raised by the father at a later point. He wept. Why? Because he saw our pain and our suffering. You don't think he felt the pain of those lashes? You don't think he felt the beating from the guards? You don't think he felt when they, when they put that crown of thorns upon his head? Yes, he felt each and every bit of it. That's the whole point. He was to suffer that death, that beating that you and I deserve, but will never have to endure. And he calls us to be faithful in everything just as he has been faithful to us. It says here, for he who promised is faithful. In other words, let us hold fast to this confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promised us this hope, who sealed this hope in his own blood, he is faithful. God is faithful, my friends. Yesterday, today and tomorrow. That is something you can guarantee on. That is something that, that you can put, if, 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 if that was a basket, if God's faithfulness was a basket, you could put all your eggs in it. Right? That's how faithful God is. He promised from long ago he delivers in the present and he will continue to deliver in the future. Which reminds me of Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 to 6 where the writer writes these words, and he's quoting these from Old Testament. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's how the builders of the church lived. That's how they lived, and that's how they died. They lived and died thinking to themselves, my God is faithful. He promised that he will never leave me nor forsake me. So what can you, my persecutor, do to me? Nothing. 
They may take our lives, but they never will take our souls. Why? Because God has got them in the palm of his hand. And what God has in his hand, no one will ever take out. But where does this writer get this from? Well, he's thinking just like, just like we should. He should be thinking that, you know, God has always stated this. And he's thinking about the words in Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, where God says, and this is God speaking through Moses to the people of Israel. Why? Because God is about to take Moses out of their midst. Moses is 120 years old, and he's not going to cross the River Jordan. He's not going off into the Promised Land. He will die on the other side of the river. And he's telling the people, be strong and courageous. Do not fear do not fear or be in dread of them. That is, your, your, your enemies who lie on the other side of the river. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And so when we feel like we're struggling with hope, can we trust in God? I think we ought to go back to the, to the Old Testament. I think we ought to go back to the book of Deuteronomy, to the book of Exodus, right? Where God is, is, he's not using a sword to bring the people out of Egypt. No, what is he using? He's using lice, he's using frogs, he's using all these different things to draw his people with a strong arm out of Egypt. And here he's saying, trust me, I will never leave you. Here's the reality. We may run away from God, but he never runs away from us. Man abandons God, but God never abandons man. We break covenant, God keeps covenant. And he has sealed that in the blood of his son. In fact, Jesus refers to this as well at the end of Matthew chapter 28. In the latter half of verse 20, Jesus says, And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. That's one of his final prophet, well, promises. Behold, I am with you, my people, my disciples, those whom I have purchased in my blood. I am with you to the end of the age. Whenever you feel like you're alone, go back to Matthew 28, verse 20. And remind yourself of what Jesus has promised you. Behold, I am with you until the end of the age. And so we can be confident. We can stand firm in the hope that Christ is always with us and he will return to us. These verses are written in order that we would be encouraged and not dismayed. Encouraged to live out our lives in Christ. And that through our own encouragement, we would encourage one another. This is why we meet the way we do. This is why internet church just doesn't work. Because we've got to mutually encourage one another. This is why fellowship is so important. This is why, you know, Christian interaction is vital to our faith. That we would be encouraged by one another to live out our faith in Christ. As the writer of Hebrews goes on in verse 24, he says this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Right? He's saying, once you've got Christ, once you understand the gravity of the gift that you have, once you understand that your hope is rooted and grounded in his person and work, once you truly come to understand and believe that he will never leave you nor forsake you, and you become that rock that is unwavering. Well, now let us consider how to stir up one another to love, to love God more, to love his people more, to love his word more, that we may produce good works. This is what he's talking about. This is our mission in life. This is how we are to wait on the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. You see, some people were saying, wait, no, I got Jesus. Thanks, guys. I'll see you when he returns. All right? Peace out. Konnichiwa. Whatever it is. Drop the mic. Whatever. He said, no, 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 no. This is not what you're called to. It's not a, I received Jesus, now let me go and live my own life, do my own thing. No. We are to continue to meet together, to encourage one another along. Right? This is why we, we have celebrations and traditions like 
Advent, to encourage each other along, to stand firm in Christ, to be unwavering in our faith, to understand you're not alone, that you've got a brother or sister that you can call to to encourage you along in this difficult thing called life, to not fall into the habit of being a loner. I know that all too well. Sometimes I'm happiest when I'm all by myself. I'm happiest when there's no one else around. But that has changed. I am most happy when I'm with all of you. I'm most happy on the Lord's Day. I may seem grumpy throughout the week or whatever, but I'm most happiest on the Lord's Day. Because I get to see you, my brothers and sisters of Christ, the people who I'm going to spend eternity with. With And we get to look, we get to feast our eyes upon the cross of the Savior. And we get to lift our eyes to heaven to remember that there is an eternal hope that is ours. That one day we will all rejoice. One day we will all drink of the fruit of the vine with our Lord Jesus Christ in his Father's house. And you can't get that if you're all alone. But he goes on. He says, but encouraging one, or one another. Right? Continue to encourage one another. And then he says here, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right? He's saying, you know, as you grow in Christ, as each day passes, we're a day closer to the second coming of Christ. We're a day closer today than we were yesterday to the second coming of Christ. We will be a day closer tomorrow as we, as, as, to the second coming of Christ as we are today. And he calls us to live with that anticipation. Listen, I hope and pray that before this sermon is over, the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And, when it, and if it doesn't happen, I'm praying that before our fellowship is over, the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Each and every morning I wake up and I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would return. But until that day comes, we dare not sit idle. We must stir each other along. Sharing the gospel over and over again with each other and with unbelievers. That day, that is going to be a beautiful day. The day of Christ's return. Imagine what that day is going to be like. And the, the writer of Hebrews is calling us to hope in that day, to stand firm in knowing that Christ will return, that that day will one day come. But until that day comes, for us to be conditioned in the hope of Christ's return, to be conditioned in hope. When you're truly hoping in something, you are living in that something. And let that something be in the return of Christ. Let us live like we boldly believe, we firmly believe, like we will stake our life on the fact that Jesus will return. And let us produce fruit of that hope. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our Holy Father and loving God, we are so very grateful for your word. We're so very grateful that you have inspired these writers, O oh God, to write of the second coming of Christ, to write of the encouragement, the, the, the understanding that needs to be ours as we wait upon Christ. We're so grateful, Lord, that he has, has opened the gates, opened the doors to your throne room, that we can come in and get closer to you through your word and through your spirit. And so help us, O oh God, to tap into that. Help us not to sit idly by. Help us not to wait and, and, and kind of sleep on our faith. Help us to stand firm in your word and to grow in your word and to encourage each other along as we wait for the second coming of Christ so that when he comes, O oh God, we will present to him a church that is washed clean by the word. For we pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.